Well, it's 10.30. Welcome, everybody, to the Extension Oz webinar on drones by Victor Villegas from Oregon in the United States. I'd uh, just like to uh, introduce the body that's bringing you this webinar. This is coming from the Extension Oz project, which is GRDC funded, along with the partners of New South Wales DPI and Ag Victoria. It's our pleasure to bring you this webinar. So there's just a little bit more about Extension Oz. It has its own website, has a strong Twitter presence, and it's also available on YouTube. So today's webinar is on UAVs in the United States. And before we actually get into the webinar itself, I'll introduce myself and run through a little housekeeping. So my name's Luke Benj and I'm a Soils Development Officer with New South Wales DPI and Regional New South Wales. And just on the slide you've got in front of you now, it shows you the control panel that uh, you should have on your screen and if you haven't used these before, I'll just take you through some of the operations. It helps you to actively participate in today's webinar. You can actually collapse and expand this control panel using the orange arrow button. So you can have it out of the way during the presentation if you wish. As the webinar will be recorded, you are all muted to minimise interference with the presenters. The audio tab allows you to select if you'll use a, a microphone and speakers through your computer, or you could select the phone audio options, where you'll need to enter a pin sent in the invitation. If you need to communicate with me during the webinar, there is a question box at the bottom of your control panel. You can also use this to direct comment to the whole group or any nominated person listening. Feel free to submit a written question or comment. Just on questions, uh, Victor, does quite like taking questions during the webinar, but we do have a large number of attendees today. We've got 45 already on and we have 96 registered. We're going to go with uh, Victor will talk for five or ten minutes and then I'll see if any questions have come in and we'll break for some questions. We'll see how the technology goes. It uh, can be a little bit awkward to handle such a large audience. so. I would prefer to try to let some individual people ask questions, so I'll try that and see how it goes. If that becomes clunky, if you could type your question in, I will read that question out to Victor and we'll do it that way. Uh, then at the end of the webinar, there will be a discussion question time. And there's a couple of ways that you can ask those questions. There's the ones I've already mentioned. But also there's the raised hands feature which you should see there now. So if you click on that, I'll know that you've got your hand raised and I'll go to you ask you to uh, read your question if you've got a microphone there. Okay. We won't worry about that last one. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Victor and say, first of all, thank you so much, Victor, for being, for kindly uh, presenting here. There's obviously huge interest in this topic amongst, uh, amongst Australians involved in growing grains. Uh, and Victor presented on this topic. Julie White was over in the United States and was lucky enough to hear Victor speak and invited Victor to speak on this topic. Uh, and I'll just let you know that over in Oregon, in the United States, Victor's telling me it's 5.30 in the afternoon and it's uh, about 28 degrees and it's a beautiful day and I believe the sun doesn't go down for probably another four and a half hours at this time of year, just to put you in the picture of, uh, of where Victor's sitting. Okay. I might just even put that back up for a moment. So a bit about Victor. Victor Viegas is the Technology and Media Support Coordinator for Oregon State University Extension Service. He provides technology support and training for faculty and staff across the state of Oregon. He enjoys helping people learn how to use technology to improve their work and lives. Victor's also a drone advocate and educator. 
As part of the leadership team for the extension Oz, extension sorry UAS in agriculture, UAS another word for drones. There's a few acronyms there that Victor will talk about. Agriculture Learning Network. He shares information on drone research and agriculture applications with other land grant universities and the general public. Mr. Viegas, however, is probably more known within the UAS industry and among drone aficionados by his alter ego, Drone Singer. The Weird Al Yankovic, I hope I get that pronunciation right, of drones. As the world's number one composer of parody songs about drones, he creates parody songs to bring attention to drone issues and culture while encouraging safe and responsible flying. And I didn't ask you, Victor, whether you're going to do any songs, but I look forward to hearing us whether that's part of your presentation. So now I'm going to hand over presenting rights to Victor, and he should be getting the messages coming through. And great. Over to you, Victor, I'll make sure that you're not muted. Yes, I should be on. You are. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you for the, that introduction and for the invitation uh, to uh, discuss the UAVs in, in the U.S. Um, well, let's get started here. I got a lot of information and uh, don't have to stick exactly to the presentation here. So if you want to know about specific things, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat box and uh, Luke will make sure to get that to me and uh, we'll try to address that. So let me put this in full screen. So uh, going to the bare basics, because I don't know exactly what all the experience that you all have there in Australia. Well, what exactly is a UAV? Well, at least here in the U.S., a UAV or U.S. is uh, known as, according to the FAA, is an unmanned aircraft capable of sustained flight in the air and controlled remotely. Basically, there's no pilot on board, but you're controlling it somehow. Uh, it's also known as UAS, which is the popular term here. Um, it's unmanned aircraft systems, or RPAS. I think they use that a lot in, in Britain. That's remote piloted aircraft system. And the system being that it's it's not just the vehicle itself, but it's the whole the transmitter, receiver, even the pilots considered part of that system. It's, it's the whole package. But everybody else here in the U.S., the, the general public knows them as drones. And so when in Rome, I call them drones. Um, if I tell people, hey, I do UAS education or UAV education, they're like, what is that? <laughs> Everybody knows them because of the museum drones, and that's what I go with because I teach the public. I have no problem. Uh, a lot of my fellow colleagues uh, at other uh, universities and you know researchers, even the military themselves, do not like to use the word drone because it is considered you know the military stuff or whatnot. It has a very negative connotation. Um, but we're trying to change that through education, of course. And here you see a picture. I just did a Google search for, for the word drone, and this is what came up, a whole bunch of different ones. So, kind of a, a little uh, side note. Uh, so uh, this, this is a little chart that's been going around drone enthusiasts uh, as a drone site chart, aircraft identification guide for airline pilots. So there's been a whole hubbub of uh, increase in drone identifications uh, and basically drones have become the new UFO. Uh, so this is a chart that, <laughs> that people have put up. It's like almost anything is out there is considered a drone uh, because the sightings are really more than likely not an actual drone but something else, um, especially that plastic bag you see there on the far right hand. Uh, British Airways uh, thought they had saw, seen a drone that hit their aircraft and it turned out to be a plastic bag. So we have a little bit of fun talking about that in the industry. So a little brief history of uh, UAS. Uh, they've been around for quite a while actually, back into the 1800s. Uh, there was um, use of hot air balloons in the Battle 
uh, in Venice, actually, in the Austrians. They sent uh, unmanned hot air balloons with bombs that, that would drop over them. Weren't very effective, but um, it was a start. And then uh, a little bit later on, we had kites with, again, um, they would try to fly them over the enemy and try to release uh, munitions and bombs. And basically, the Wright brothers, uh, the glider kite, and this is before they, uh, their airplane, um, they flew kites trying to, to figure out um, how flight worked. And uh, this, this is basically an unmanned kite, right? So this is the start of the unmanned aircraft. So in uh, World War I, they started developing, now, you know, after the Wrights brothers had, had uh, invented the airplane, uh, Orville Wright here um, helped to build this Kettering Bug. It's basically a flying torpedo, and uh, they were hoping to use that during World War I, and it had a very simple guidance system and a timer, uh, a gyro to kind of keep it going in a certain direction, and at a certain time it was supposed to release and then fall over the enemy. Unfortunately, it wasn't very uh, reliable and it didn't see much use because the generals thought it might actually fall over their own <laughs> soldiers, and that was a little too dangerous, so didn't see much action. But it was the start of military use of unmanned aircraft systems. So between World War I and World War II, uh, the U.S. started using what they called target drones. Um, these were basically unmanned aircraft used for target practice for Navy ships and uh, trying to get their gunners to be a little bit more accurate. Obviously, they didn't want to use real airplanes, so they used remote-controlled aircraft, uh, such as these here, uh, to be used as targets. Uh, incidentally, that uh, the lady that you see there in the picture uh, is Norma Jean, better known as Marilyn Monroe, who was actually discovered uh, working at a drone factory uh, when she became famous. So uh, now coming more to modern day times, uh, again, the military has been the, the main source of the UAS uh, with the Reaper and Predator drones that are popular, uh, been used in the Middle East. And again, this is the, what the media has gotten a hold of uh, to instill fear in the public, and the public uh, equates UAS and drones with military operations. On the civilian side of things, uh, model airplanes basically came into being uh, way before aviation itself. I mean, the Wright brothers were playing with, with model gliders. Uh, but the powered stuff started in like the 1930s, a little bit after World War II, as pilots came back from the war. Uh, you know, they wanted to keep that uh, love of aviation alive, and so they started building uh, remote control airplanes because radar technology now existed for them to actually create these model airplanes, and it became a great sport, and it still is today. Farther on, 1990s, uh, Japan started using remote-controlled helicopters uh, to do agricultural spraying of their rice fields. This is a Yamaha R-Max, and it is about, uh, has a propeller about uh, six to eight uh, feet long. Uh, it's, it's a rather big remote-controlled helicopter. It carries about three pounds of uh, pesticide. And um, actually just got approved here in the U.S. For pesticide uh, dispersal, but it's you know it's been used uh, for over 20 years in Japan. Types of UAVs today. So these are the most common ones. We have the fixed wings there. That's the one on your right that looks more like a glider or an air. And then we have what most people consider as drones is the multi rotors or the quadcopter. Here it has four motors. We also have hexacopters at six motors, and there's octocopters with eight, and there's tricopters with three. So there are different variations on the multi-rotors, but the most popular seems to be the quadcopters. Now, the technology that enables uh, these things to fly was developed from some game systems. There was a guy who was experimenting 
with uh, the Wii. If you're familiar with the Wii game controllers, they're the, the chucks that you can actually move around. Inside of them, there's some special chips that have uh, electric gyros that let you tell what is up and down and sideways when you do any type of movement. And so he figured he could put that into a multi-rotor and have it stabilize easier. Because uh, traditionally, you'd have to fly them manually. It was very difficult. Uh, but with these chips, they could stabilize. You could actually calibrate it and um, almost fly these hands free. Uh, even the fixed wing aircraft uh, have capabilities of having this type of technology on board. Uh, we also have GPS, which is Global Positioning System uh, technology available for a lot of these systems. And that allows us to pinpoint uh, exactly where the vehicle is on a map. We can also tell it where to go. Um, so there are pieces of software that you, you can actually outline a path uh, and a certain height at where you want this uh, vehicle to fly, and it will go and fly that path autonomously based on the GPS coordinates. A little bit about uh, UAS agricultural research here in the U.S., uh, here at Oregon State University, we have flown them over potato fields and uh, with special sensors to, to measure uh, potato crop stress. So uh, there's uh, special sensors, there's NDVI sensors, there's uh, near infrared, uh, infrared, thermal, they're pretty much these these vehicles are basically just platforms. I mean, they're really cool stuff, but the more important thing is the data that we can collect via these sensors and then try to figure out how we can use that data to get actionable um, so we can actually make decisions on how to, to, to grow crops or, or change you know, crop management or whatnot. Uh, so with these sensors that we flew over the potato crops, we were able to see that there was crop stress. Um, the pictures that we get back from these sensors on the computer actually show us a gamma of colors and a very bright green tells us that that's a very healthy plant. Uh, but when you start seeing a false color that's kind of pinkish going towards purple and blue, that means it's, it's more stressed. We don't know exactly why it's stressed, but we know that there's a problem with the plant. And this we're able to see uh, via the sensors on the computer before it's even visible to the naked eye. So we're able to catch it early. Uh, and we're able to go to that specific area where the stress is, walk the field, just that specific area, and figure out, okay, is this caused by lack of water? Is it too much water? Is it pest infestation? What not? Uh, over here, we're trying to work on developing sensors that we can read different signatures for the different types of, of stress. Uh, so for instance, if we had a certain pest, um, we we're hoping to be able to develop a sensor that will read for that type of pest and say, yes, this is a stress and it's being caused by this pest or this type of pest, or this is being caused by water. We're not quite there yet. Right now we just can tell that there's a problem, but we haven't gotten to the point where we can tell what is causing the problem. So that's the next step in our research. Uh, I also had some researchers fly over uh, nurseries, plant nurseries, so that's, it's a very big industry here in Oregon. And uh, traditionally, we'd have to go and count all of the potted plants manually by hand, which uh, if you can imagine with some of our nurseries being almost a mile long of plants, could be a very tedious process, time consuming. And so by taking a picture with, uh, again, certain special sensors, we're able to run the pictures through some special algorithms, computationally uh, records what, how many pots or plants are in a specific location. So if you can see right here on the right-hand side, you see those numbers, 375, 440, 407. It's actually reading how many plants are per row, and it does that very quickly accurate, but it, it, it's um, it, it really depending on how much foliage is, how much separation between the pots, but it gives you a very close estimate of how many plants you have for inventory purposes. Uh, as I mentioned, 
the RMAX uh, has just been approved for aerial spraying. Uh, this is mainly for specialty crops such as vineyards, uh, for grapes, areas where you can't take manned aircraft uh, very easily because of hilly terrain or very small acreage farms. And so uh, they were experimenting uh, with the applications, uh, but I believe uh, in April or May is when they finally approved and uh, they're going to be starting that. Uh, that research was done at uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, another interesting research project, this one at the Washington State University uh, by Dr. Lav Cott, is um, flying a small, uh, very similar to the RMX, this one's a Yamaha Phaser, um, flying over cherry crops. So we have cherries here in the Pacific Northwest, and when they're ready to be finally ripened, sometimes we get some moisture, some rain. And, and if you get too much, it actually will split the fruit and spoil it, and you lose a lot of the fruit. So traditionally what they've done is they usually had some type of a orchard sprayer. You can see the machine there in the upper right-hand corner, or actual bent helicopters uh, trying to dry the moisture off of the cherries. Uh, some people have gotten killed, pilots got, gotten killed, because obviously they have to fly fairly low in order to be effective. Um, so they're looking at using remote controlled helicopters, uh, the crops, so that they can actually disperse the water and dry it in that way and see how effective that is. Um, it should be a lot safer uh, because we don't have water and um, hopefully more cost effective too. So um, some of the limits that we have here in the U.S., uh, uh, it's not so much the T is advancing very, very rapidly. It's more the especially on the commercial side of things. And even in research, we have to deal with uh, the FAA, which is our uh, governing body for aviation. It's the Federal Aviation Administration. There's a link on here if you'd like to find more information about UAS uh, regulations. And basically, um, for the longest time, we were actually prohibited from doing uh, any type of commercial use of unmanned aerial vehicles uh, up until December of, was it December, January of 2014? Uh, well, no, actually uh, it was 2015. So early 2015, they finally came with a process uh, to allow commercial use of drones uh, via what is called a 333 exemption. And that's basically exempting us from uh, some of the requirements that manned, um, manned aircraft uh, have to follow. Um, it wasn't perfect, but um, it at least allowed some people to apply for that. It was a very tedious process. You, had, you usually had to wait six to nine months uh, to get that approved. Uh, you had to get a, an N number, which is like a registration number, just like any other uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, and the requirements were fairly stiff. Uh, you had to have a commercial, well, not commercial, but you had to have a, uh, a full pilot, pilot in order to fly an unmanned aircraft commercially. Uh, as you can imagine, trying to fly basically what is considered a consumer toy um, commercially, but having to have a manned aircraft certificate to do so uh, was fairly burdensome. So recently, um, this was actually June 21st, 22nd of this year, uh, they have come up and published new rules it's called Part 107. They're going to go in effect in August. Uh, they have relaxed a lot of the requirements uh, that the 333 exemption process had. Uh, for example, we are now going to be able to not require a uh, private pilot uh, certificate to fly them. 
Um, there will not be a class two medical uh, requirement. Um, uh, basically, folks will just have to take a test um, that's specifically geared to UAS, which we haven't had until this this moment. Well, all we had was basic uh, uh, flight navigation and rules uh, type of, of test that we had to take. Um, but now it's going to be more specific to UA, UAV and UAS. And um, so lots of good stuff coming. Yes. Excuse me for inter. We got some questions. Yeah, we do. We've got quite a few coming since you raised this topic. So they've been uh, great. Written here. I'll just uh, read them out to you, Victor. So the uh, first one is Carl Robinson says, Hi, Victor. It was at the start. Uh, then uh, earlier on, about um, a few minutes ago, uh, Phil Lyons said, I think this is the name of their, our equivalent uh, organisation is called CASA, C A S A, in, in Australia. That, yes, uh, the regulating. Right here. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> that was my next slide. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. So, yes. And then Craig, Craig, yes. uh, uh, Craig White has said regulations are also limitation in Australia and it varies between the states here in Australia. And then mm. we have a, a question here from Gary O'Leary. And Gary writes, the modern drones utilise high-tech GPS and flight stabilising systems. So my question is, are there plans for ADS-B out from drones so that they can be seen by modern aircraft with ADS-B in, question mark, modern drones utilise, I don't know whether, I better read the whole thing in case um, it's all one question. Modern drones utilise high-tech GPS and flight stabilising systems. Oh, sorry, it's written twice. No, I think it's the same <laughs> question written twice. So that was Gary's question. Oh, okay, yeah, I understood. So, um, yes, there are uh, folks that are developing that, uh, trying to get it small enough and cheap enough to put it on small systems. Um, don't know exactly if that's going to be required or not for at least the small UAS. Um, it will probably definitely be, uh, most likely be required for anything that's over 55 pounds, um, which is fairly large. And uh, as you probably heard, Amazon is trying to look to do um, delivery by drone. Uh, so any of their systems, if they're flying autonomously, obviously are going to have to have some type of a uh, DBS, which is basically um, a system that will announce itself on on radar or you know other aircraft where it is located so that they can see it on their computer. So yes, it's it's people are working on it. Uh, will it be required? It, again, it's probably it's going to be required on certain size aircraft and. Um, depending on what type of application, such as delivery or, or something where there's heavy air, aircraft uh, traffic. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Phil Lyons has, has written that as of mid-September, CASA will allow a farmer to fly over their own land without a licence. And... Oh, yeah. Nice. And Gary, who asked the question about the GPS and ADS-B out, etc. He said, uh, thanks, a great answer. Gary has said, so thank you very much, Victor. Uh, we might sure. let you continue on. Yeah, one, one of the problems with, one of the problems with that um, ADS-B is that uh, the U.S. now has more drones registered than total number of actual manned aircraft. <laughs> so you can imagine if we put one of those systems on every single drone, um, the radar operators would be totally overwhelmed. And so, uh, again, trying to limit it maybe to the, just the larger, more heavier uh, vehicles would probably make sense. Um, Talking about uh, allowing farmers to fly over their their own fields, uh, this new Part 107 is basically going to be the way to do that. It will cost about $150, take a test, um, and then they'll be able to do it. Up until now, they really haven't been able to do that because it was quite a bit of investment of money. You had to take you know traditional flight school, 
and go through that. So you're talking about five, five, seven, eight thousand dollars to go through that process just to fly a little, you know, pro consumer drone. So a lot of folks have actually been flying and not doing any of that certification. Um, so I'm glad that they've they've brought uh, the requirements down, and um, they've even put in a. Uh, an option to be able to fly uh, what is called uh, beyond line of sight. Uh, so right now the FS FAA says that you can only fly within the visual line of sight. That means you have to have eyes on the vehicle, on the aircraft. You have to be able to see it with your own eyes unaided. You can't be using a telescope or whatnot, which uh, limits us quite a bit here in the U.S. because you know some of the farms that we have are thousands of acres. It's just huge, and in order to be efficient, you'd you'd have to have some type um, all of that area. And obviously, you're not going to keep that within your site. Well, there's a provision in Part 107 that will allow uh, for an observer to have his eyes on it with your observer. That still doesn't give you a a big, big distance, but it's, it's a step in, in the right direction. Um, also, they're going to be allowing in remote rural areas, which is to be able controlling uh, the UAV. So you can actually cover greater distance by going along on the road and you know obviously flying it, but still maintaining the aircraft in the uh, visual line of sight. Just, uh, so some of the limitations Sorry, yes. but the, the Phil Lyons has, has uh, put in a comment there. There's Australian UAV operators can apply for capital letters B V L O S dispensation. Yeah, I'm actually kind of jealous of some of the, the stuff you have uh, out in Australia. Up until you know this 107 that's that's going to be coming out in August, um, our regulations were very very restrictive. As a matter of fact, um, as an educator, um, I was not allowed to even fly a little, um, let's see if I can show you here. Can you see that little tiny nano drone that I have there flying above my hand? That thing fits within the palm of my hand and I could not fly that outdoors without having a pilot certificate according to the FAA. <laughs> No, we're not. I, we're not seeing your visual there. That's how bad it, it, it was. Oh, okay. Well, let me try that again. Yeah, I'll keep it from full screen. How's that? Can you yep, see that? That's working. Okay. So there's a little tiny nano drone there flying above my hand, and uh, yes, uh, I could not fly that without having a pilot certificate, according to FAA, because I was doing it in my professional capacity as an and that is considered a commercial operation. So that's how silly some of these regulations have been. We're really looking forward to that Part 107, which will allow me to do some of this stuff. Now, as a public institution, we have another way of, of being able to do our research. Um, it's different than the commercial use under the 333 exemption. It's called a certificate of authorization. It's basically a waiver. A waiver. It's called a COA. And uh, that allows us to fly under um, uh, a certain uh, regulation, special regulations that the FAA has set up. Uh, there are some guidelines we, we have to keep under 400 feet. Um, we have to only fly during the day. Um, there has to be, uh, again, a certified pilot to fly it um, the, and an observer. Uh, and both the pilot and the observer have to have a class two medical, um, and you have to stay uh, 500 feet away from uh, objects, uh, obstacles, um, structures that are not involved in part of whatever you're you're working on. You cannot fly over people that are not part of your uh, project or are involved 
in the operation. So various stipulations, but basically with that COA we have a national one where we can actually uh, fly. Of course we have to put in a request. Um, it takes about, you know, within at least 24 to 48 hours to get that approved for us to do uh, this stuff. Better. So at this point, I'd, you know, I'd like to take some more questions if, if you have any. If not, I can go on to something else. Okay. Oh, photo. Uh, yes, we've got, uh, first of all, Phil Lyons just explained what I read out as uh, BVLOS is beyond, beyond visual line of sight. Now, Craig White, Craig White has uh, written a question here, and he asks, what really defines commercial gain? Probably a broad meaning, for example, if capturing photos and video <laughs> for future training purposes, which may lead to a sale of a product, is that considered essential, essentially commercial? Yes, according to the FAA here in the United States, yes. So basically it's based on intent. So if your intent is to, to do something commercially with this, uh, even if you're doing it in the future and you maybe not getting paid now, uh, or you're being compensated in any shape, way, or form, and that's not only just money. I mean, you can be compensated with other things. Um, then, yes, that is com considered commercial use in the in the FAA's eyes. Uh, so, a lot of people were trying to say, "Oh, well, I am not uh, charging people to fly my drone for the photo editing we're taking." with a drone and so that's and you're making money off of those photos and that's considered commercial <laughs> um, lots of different ways that people have been trying to bypass uh, those regulations uh, but the FAA says no no if, if you're using it to further your business uh, as a farmer if you're flying just for fun recreationally no problem but the second that you use any of the data that photo um, to make a decision to use it for your farm. If you're promoting your farm, you take a picture, you put it on your website, and that's commercial use. Right. And Craig says thanks, it's, uh, and he interprets it the same way. So I've got a, a question now from Ken King, and Ken writes, will there be, oh, sorry, yes, will there be a recording of this webinar available for viewing after it's finished? And the answer, Ken, is, is yes. Uh, once we're finished, I'll hit record, and our plan, as we've done before, would be to make that available on the Extension Oz website. So keep an eye out, out for that. I will uh, try to remember to put that website up again before, before we finish. Uh, now, there, if you had would like to ask a question, uh, use, using your own voice or through the microphone and please hit the raised hands button. I'm just searching for for any raised hands at the moment. Can't see one but we had Phil Phil Lyons has uh, made a statement here, Victor, just saying that Australian farmers will be able to use images or data without any license. So that's encouraging. It gives you another reason to envy our Very nice. at the moment for once. Uh, now just searching for for any other raised hands. Oh, we have uh, David Pratt is writing, Hello Victor, would like to know more about information about the sensors. Say for example the stress sensors. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh um, agriculture right now is, is for NDVI. I'll look it up here in Google. I don't have a slide for that. Oh, but we can't. Uh, Okay, so um, NDVI sensor, let's visit the page here, 
www.gulfdrones.com. <clears throat> so uh, basically the NDVI, here, here on the upper left hand is a, a straight photo. Uh, it's normal as what you see visually with the naked eye. Um, and then there is... We're not saying you're visual, there, Victor. Not yet. Oh, it's not? Okay. Um, let's this. It's Julie here. I, I can see it. Oh, sorry. That's just not on my screen then. Okay. I'm not sure about the other participants, but... Yep. There's How about two, now? two other people saying they can see it. It's just my screen. So go ahead. Yep, everyone else can see it. That's oh, good. Okay. Oh, <laughs> and now I can too. All right. Oh, okay. Well, I'll stay on this one. I have a virtual screen, so I can go back and forth. Okay, so um, back to stretch this a little bit here. So there's um, you can see this the square here. It's that's the uh, middle on the bottom uh, of those images there. It's NDVI detail. That's what we're looking at when we're, when we're seeing the NDVI. Um, it's new, uh, neutral density visual index and it's, it gives us kind of like a false color so if you can see the really bright green um, that is is basically measured off of the, the leaves or anything that's green uh, so the chlorophyll right it's uh, the more green it is the more chlorophyll the more healthy the plant it'll give us this bright greenish color um, the the less chlorophyll you plant, the more likelihood that it is stressed, uh, and then so you start getting the darker, you know, uh, colors uh, get into so the see if I can increase this a little bit more. There's a little bit of kind of pinkish in there, and then we get the blue, really dark blue and stuff. That's almost pretty much dead. Uh, so if you can look at the visual photograph here and see the difference. So some of these areas, orange, there's like no vegetation there, and then we have the greenish, um, yellowish, it's kind of very uh, not, not dense vegetation. So that's basically what we're looking at when we're looking at NDVI. Now there's a pink one over here, this is um, uh, infrared. Uh, Again, it's a false color, it's, it's, but it picks up stuff that we can't see uh, visually. And then there is the one right next to it, it's the near infrared. So they're basically different uh, spectrums measuring different wavelengths of, uh, of light. Another popular use of, um, of drones in agriculture and also a lot of other industry to uh, do mapping so we can actually do three 3d mapping uh, there is a cloud-based solution it's called drone deploy and uh, basically uh, you sign up for this uh, you can upload your imagery, process uh, the photos and uh, stitch them together and do 3D models such as this one right here. So I'm able to actually move it around and see the different elevation. Hopefully you can see that. through. Uh, they can also do NDVI analysis. So this is a soy bean field NDVI. Anytime. <laughs> Doesn't seem to want to be coming up. Well, you can see a representation. There's terrain models. Oh, not having luck with this website right now. Uh, got one here, suggestion for a site here. We've got a couple of questions coming in. I'll just, I'll just take back the presenters' rights uh, for a second. Sure. 
Victor, because we've been sent a, a website by Phil Lyons, which I've managed to get up. So I'll just put that up. Um, go to here. Can you see that, Victor? Oh, I'll get rid of that question. I'm not, I, I think I still have the rights. Okay. Uh, I can see away. that now. You can see Falcon my, my UAV, screen. it says. Falcon UAV, yeah. So we're seeing that, Victor, sorry if you're not, but that, that was a suggestion. Oh, now I can, yes. Okay. Yes, I see it now. So the website is Falcon UAV and it's selected mm -hmm. ag agriculture, for, for, gone to photos and then selected agriculture. There you go, yeah. Yeah, so you can see what, uh, yeah, they're using the Ag Eagle, which is very popular, uh, fixed wing, being used from, uh, for, from some commercial operators here in the U.S. too. Uh, Ag Eagle is actually world, worldwide, so. Okay. Uh, so I've got some other questions which I'll just pop up. Um, so, oh, Glenn Reith Miller is asking, what is the most common NDVI camera used on UAVs in the USA? <laughs> oh. Truthfully, I don't know. Um, there, there's several of them out there. I'm not a specialist on the sensors themselves. Um, so I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. I just know that NDVI is the, the most popular uh, sensor in agriculture at the moment. Okay. And uh, Phil Lyons has written that Australian upload speeds are generally way too slow to use cloud processing, unfortunately. Right, uh, and then so there are software packages where you can do this on your computer. Um, here in the U.S., they're kind of expensive. Uh, even the cloud-based one it is, and um, that should start going down with you know more people having access to that. So that's the stuff that's still being. Since we haven't had a, a large number of people being able to do this commercially. Uh, you know, the prices are still high, but once uh, 107 comes out, I'm hopeful that uh, with the influx of, uh, you know, several thousands of more uh, uh, commercial pilots, we'll be able to, you know, see lower prices on a lot of these products. Great. And um, Rob Gunn, I'll just call it up here. Uh, Yep, Rob Gunn has written, how, how do the results vary between data collected with an RGB camera using drone deployed to process versus NIR, NIR camera or a multispectral camera processed with other software such as PIX4D? Again, I'm not, I'm not uh, the sensor specialist, <laughs> so I wouldn't be able to answer that uh, with any type of authority. Um, RGB is basically, you know, the visual what you see um, with your eyes, pretty much. Uh, NDVI is picking up stuff that uh, we can't see visually, and then the other one, you know, near infrared, uh, just different spectrums that we can't see. So RGB would be the, the simplest form, which is basically just a photograph. Um, you can put a filter on an RGB camera to give you the false color for. Um, um, ultraviolet light or to filter out certain colors, um, but it, it's still very close to what you're seeing with your eye already. Uh, so that's why NDVI is, is more popular because it is picking up stuff uh, that we can't see at all. Great. And so David Pratt has written, thanks Victor, we currently use NDVI for biomass form satellite photos, but cloud becomes an issue. And then David. Yes. Uh, David also says, uh, "Thank, thank." Yeah, that's you. a big problem with with a lot of these systems. The you know the big data. <laughs> There's gigabytes of data. The the research that we did uh, over our potato fields, 
uh, we, we get five gigabytes of information from, from one flight, and we have to send that over um, fiber optic cable over to um, the processor overnight, and we didn't get their information until the next day. Yeah, because it was, you know, it's 500 gigabytes from a 10-minute flight. It's just insane. Uh, you can imagine something that was, you know, several hours of information. And so you know, trying to figure out what is the important data that you need um, so that you're not overloading yourself with data and uh, finding something that you can actually make a decision based on that. It, we're still at the very beginning of, of all this technology. I, I know it sounds like it's been around for forever, but it hasn't really. I mean, this this stuff is still new. And Daily, it's 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 amazing. Um, five years from now, there might be a totally different landscape. You know, new sensors or whatnot. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, third parties, are selling these services. Uh, because a lot of the farmers really don't want to actually do it themselves. I mean, they're farmers. They're not necessarily processors or, or analysts or anything like that. Uh, Owning these, uh, for example, the Ag Eagle there, I mean, that's several thousand dollars. It's, it's you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for some of these systems. The average farmer is not going to pay for that, but he'll pay for uh, somebody to, some agronomist to come in and fly his field, you know, uh, three times a year or something like that. Very similar to what you do with uh, manned uh, photography or, or uh, satellite systems. Um, so, but a lot of these folks that are selling these services, um, you know, s saying, hey, this is going to help you when the research is, is still still being done. We, like, like I told you, we can tell that there's stress on the plants, but we can't tell you exactly what is causing that stress. And will it help you grow a better crop in, for next year or for the next, you know, decade? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you know, the jury's still out whether that's cost effective just yet. Uh, the research is still being developed. So, um, you know, folks are trying to sell this, this, these as complete solutions, and they're not quite there yet. So, uh, buyer beware. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, David, thanks you for that. And we have Dave Monks in Mildura, down in the southeastern part of Australia. Are the regression equations these commercial guys are using being generated by third parties? Are they developing them themselves as their own IP? Um, both. Uh, again, it, it costs a lot of money to, to do all the processing. So it's, it's mainly bigger companies uh, that are doing it. Uh, so an, an agronomist might actually, or a consultant, uh, probably is doing the data processing through something like drone deploy or some other system. It's not necessarily themselves because uh, it's not cost effective for them. So it's a, you know, you're getting a service from a third party who's getting his service from another party. Um, it's just the way it works. Fair enough. And uh, just going back to a, what we were talking about earlier on, Phil Lyons has written in a comment saying that RGB cannot give NDVI, you need the NIR or near infrared. Right, they're, they're separate sensors. Yep. And I'm just having a look around to see if there are any raised hands. Just, oh yes, we have another question uh, or comment from Sebastian Lee. And Sebastian says, NDVI is just an index based on a portion of the infrared, hang on a sec, NDVI spectrum. is just index based on a portion of the infrared spectrum that can be derived from NIR, comma, multi-spec, uh, et cetera, other s uh, sensors. So that's, thanks, Sebastian. Uh, David Pratt is writing, oh, did you want to, any comment there, Victor, before I go on to David? Well, uh, only to say that a lot of these systems uh, are using multiple sensors, so um, there's a SensiFly, I believe, has a, a platform that, that does three to five different sensors all at once. 
and then they can overlay. So you get the visual, you get the infrared, you get you know your thermal, your NDVI, and you can look at the differences between them. And maybe with the, the compilation of all that data, you're able to get uh, uh, better information. So not there's no one sensor that will give you everything that you need. So the more sensors you have, uh, the better. But again, that gets more expensive. Some of these sensors. Um, are more expensive than the platforms themselves. The platforms are actually getting very, very cheap. Uh, but we have sensors, uh, LIDAR sensors, which is basically uh, light radar uh, that gives us 3D models of um, elevations and whatnot. Uh, you know, $50,000 $50, and up um, and flying them on a $3,000 platform <laughs> of it's not something that everybody can afford just yet. But again, the technology is developing. Uh, there is a LiDAR now that's supposedly coming out for about $3,000, about the size of a hockey puck, and almost light enough to, to fly on something um, like an Inspire, a DJI Inspire or something similar. So uh, prices are coming down. Again, we're at the very beginning. There's new sensors coming out. Everything's getting cheaper. Uh, the future looks really bright, but right now we're still experimenting uh, and can't say, you know, this is the way to do it just yet. Everybody's still learning. Okay. Uh, just letting you know, the so the what's up on your screen at the moment has the website uh, on which we will load this webinar. For those people that couldn't attend, if you can let them know, we'll advertise that through the, ex the extension Oz. Uh, Great. Uh, David Pratt. Uh, commenting back on what you said a minute ago, saying he to I totally agree. Ground truthing of data is a huge issue. So many variables. Sometimes more data just becomes a distraction from the core business of growing crops. Thanks for that comment, David. Uh, yes, definitely can be. Yep. Um, yeah, you still want to ground truth it no matter what. <laughs> I mean, th this stuff is not 100% uh, reliable. Uh, and it may never be, uh, but it, it does cut down on some time. So you can tell there's a stress in a certain area. You don't have to you know, concentrate on that area versus your whole field. Um, it becomes more important the bigger the area that you're growing. So it does save some time. Obviously, you know, the, the nursery plant counting and stuff, that saves a lot of human labor. Um, so there are some advantages, but we're still discovering how much of that uh, is helpful and how, of it, how much of it is you know, busy work <laughs> with all the big data. Yep. So there's a question coming for you, Julie, in a second, if you could un get ready to unmute yourself. But Phil Lyons, has, uh, Phil Lyons is writing that generally Australian UAV operators charge around 5 to $8 per hectare for NDVI. Uh, mm. but just got a question here from Craig White, which uh, I just, if Julie's available, have Julie White, who's running the um, uh, Extension Oz Crop Nutrition Project here with us in New South Wales DPI. And Craig White um, asked the question, are you planning further webinars on this topic and maybe on types of sensors and their applications? Uh, if you're there, Julie, would you like to field that one? Not hearing you, Julie. Oh, I see. Thought for a minute the relative. Huh? Uh, can you hear me now, Luke? Yes, can hear you, Julie. Go ahead. Um, yes, we are planning to. One of the. I actually sent a message to Luke while we were running then saying that people have particular topics they wouldn't. And it's. Surely it's Luke here. I'm having we're having your sound has disappeared, unfortunately. It seemed that there were quite a few quick got gotcha you back. Topic that no um, suggestion. Sorry, Judy, go ahead everyone. We can hear you. Um on that yes they're looking to do oh, okay. <laughs> open to a topic you would like us to cover. You can contact me directly or contact us through Twitter. 
um, or if you just want to do a quick poll now uh, for the people that are still online as to what topic, but census did seem to be one that there were some more detailed questions about. Right. Um, so, um, can I can I um, share a resource? Yes. Please do. Okay. So, um, Luke, if you could. Uh, oh, sorry. I give you a presenter. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Screen, so I can. <laughs> yep. Thank you. There we go. Okay. So I'm also part of the leadership team for the E Extension UAS. Uh, in Agricultural Learning Network, and we have a website. Uh, yes. Ag. So it's uh, learnuasag.org. And we have uh, presented several webinars, uh, 10 of them as a matter of fact. Uh, there was one actually on sensors. Um, so there's a remote sensing nuts and bolts of UAS. Uh, go to this website, look at uh, the webinars we presented in the past. We also have uh, YouTube videos of the webinars. So you can click on the YouTube right here and see our previous webinars. Uh, there's Mapping Basics, um, UAS Instrumentation, uh, let's see, Agrobotic, oh here it goes, UAS Flight Controllers and Sensors by Joe Maja. Um, so I recommend going there, uh, Innovative Uses of UAV in Agriculture. We, we have quite a few resources up there already that you can go and reference. We also have a Twitter feed and a Facebook page of, let's see if, can you, whoops, you started the video there. <laughs> uh, let's see, Facebook, UAS. So facebook.com slash learn UAS ag. Um, I post about three to five times a week. Uh, on information on UAS and agriculture. So that's another resource you can look, and it's stuff not just from the US, it's around the world. Um, news, uh, commercial uses, regulations, and all that. So that's another resource you can, you can go to. Great, thanks Victor. Uh, around that discussion of further, further topics, as Julie commented, uh, Let's see what I've got. Oh, yeah, Craig White saying that's a big topic that UAVs in agriculture in Australia. Uh, David Pratt suggesting sensors and processing software. Be interested in a webinar on that. Uh, Glenn Reithmuller says that NDVI sensors and batch processing software for the future he would be interested in. Uh, Craig White is writing when the new CASA regulations become active in Australia this year, a webinar going over that would be useful perhaps, or maybe just ahead of the regulations. So we've got a lot, and those top things that you've written down uh, are kept by this uh, product, so we'll be able to have all that data. Thank you for writing that down. Uh, Gary? Yes, uh, and I do have a contact person um, in Australia um, who actually has done training for, for CASA um, certification. So um, let me know, and I could probably get them uh, for you guys to, to go over some of that stuff too. Great. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Gary O'Leary is writing, one of the major problems with this technology is knowing what it means so that farmers can apply the best strategy in response to various images, etc. Thanks for that comment, Gary. Oh, this has been a terrific response. So many of you have... You didn't have any comment there, Victor, for that on that last comment from Gary? 
Yeah, there's there's applications still coming out. I mean, a lot of people are going over, you know, the NDVI and the sensor stuff. But there's there's other uses. There's um, um, some research being done on using drones to actually measure uh, mass. Um, so you know, mounds of fertilizer, know how much you have. There's uh, using thermal uh, sensors uh, over piles of beet uh, to tell which ones are spoiling. And so you can, you know, separate them. Um, it, so it's not just, you know, the, the crops that you're growing, but it just management of your farm in general. Um, there are some experiments going using thermal cameras to see when cattle are in heat um, and when they're going to deliver, um, being able to, to notify you in the field of that. Uh, so it, it's, it's way bigger than just crops. Right. Phil Lyons has written that that NDVI variable rate prescription maps save lots of dollars in fertilizer if that's what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if that's what the problem is exactly. <laughs> and that's that's yet to be determined. We have but it's it's an, it's another tool. Yep. And Dave M is writing direct link direct link to the UAS flight controllers and sensors on the Learn UAS Ag YouTube channel. And he's given us, uh, if you want to write this down, uh, HTTPS, then the double dots, colon, I suppose, the two forward slashes and YouTube. It's actually, he's got Y-O-U, T-U, full stop, V-E, forward slash, capital B, 88, capital L, capital J, Capital E, I'm going to have to copy that. And, but yeah, I'll put it on the website. I think we better send it yep. to participants. Yeah. <laughs> well, no one will get that right, I don't think. No, <laughs> sorry. I might want to put that in the chat box or something. Yep, I'll do that now, thank you. Okay, let's do that. Meanwhile, while I'm trying to do that, Nicholas Lyons has asked, is there any difference in rate of use or adoption between cropping and livestock farms in the US? Mm, crops seem to be the biggest thing right now, um, mainly because of the regulations. Uh, you know, if you're doing any type of uh, herd management, uh, they're spread out over large areas and you have to fly beyond line of sight. So until we get beyond of line of sight capabilities legally, uh, that's going to be limited, even for the crop stuff, but even more so for uh, the livestock. Okay. Just scrolling down. To, oh, and Nicholas has written again. Next question from Nicholas again. Do you see these type of technologies more as to be used by farmers or by consultants as a service? In the US, I think um, probably consultants are going to be the main ones using it. Again, farmers, you know, this is cool and stuff. They might get a DJI Phantom or a 3D robotic solo to, to fly there you know, the field take pictures or stuff like that. But they, they're really wanting to leave the, the data processing to someone else. Um, and the maintenance of these things, you know, some of the largest systems of, you know, they break down, you have to fix them, you have to keep the software updates. I mean, what farmer is going to want to deal with that on a constant basis? Uh, so I see mainly uh, consultants, uh, th you know, third party uh, people that are that are providing these services. So, yeah, drone is a service basically um, versus the individual farmers, especially with the large farms that we have here in the U.S. It's just not practical to to do it yourself. Okay, I'm just pasting in that website from Dave Monk and sending that and putting that up in the in the chat box. Be able to see that, hopefully. So, 
got so many coming in here that uh, I'm losing track. I think I've asked both of Nicholas's questions. Yep, so Dave M has suggested repost it. I think that just means post the, repost it. Right, I've put it up there in the chat box. Hopefully you can see it. Glenn Reith Muller is uh, asking, um, it says AH, so that might mean are there thermal cameras for UAVs are another topic too. Okay, so thermal cameras for UAVs are another suggested topic from Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Phil Lyons is saying an Ag Eagle flyer in the South Island, New Zealand uses NDVI to identify healthy and in inverted commas pastures. Thanks, Phil. Mm. Seems to be a lot of a lot of uses. And Nicholas Lyons is saying, excellent, thanks. So you're getting a lot of... Uh, this is much yeah, another use that just came to mind, there's um, research being done dropping um, ladybugs uh, from drones into, uh, onto fields in order to combat aphids. <laughs> so, you know, a ladybug delivery service via drone. Okay. Um, okay, so we might be able to put some links up on uh, the Extension Oz website, perhaps for some of those sites you've provided there, Victor. I don't, I don't, Excellent. Don't see any more any more written questions coming in. That's you've broken the records, Victor, for the most number of questions and comments. Well done. <laughs> Great. Right. Well, if anybody has other questions later on, uh, here's my contact information. Uh, my email address, victor.viegas at oregonstate.edu. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my professional Twitter account is at OSU E-X-T-T-E-C-H, extension tech. Um, and you can also follow my at drone singer account for all things drone uh, with a little bit of humor. <laughs> so. Um, you can reach me any of those ways. I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to look me up there. Right, Victor, I'll be looking for the drone singer. I hope there's some recordings of your songs there. Look forward to that. Yes, I have some stuff on uh, YouTube and SoundCloud. If you just type in drone singer as one word into Google, I'm sure you'll find some of my uh, my songs. All right, Gary O'Leary. Hey, Luke, can I just... Yes, go, Julie. Sorry. Victor, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time and I know you get asked to um, do this sort of thing a lot so we really appreciate you dedicating your evening to um, we Aussies. So very kind of you. Thanks, Victor. You're welcome. Glad to uh, help out in any way I can. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, we might call that to a close if anybody wants to uh, follow up on this look on our on our website and uh, thanks for everybody and we'll talk to you very very soon Victor <laughs> okay I might email you another phone number because I don't know the one I sent you was was working but uh, yeah we'll talk to you in a bit okay doc. and we're getting plenty of uh, people writing and saying thank you Daria Lear, Phil Lyons yep fantastic okay have a great day bye everyone Hi, y'all.